Great. So uh, thank you. I, I lost my voice at the end of my second wing lecture presentation. I've been trying to find it for the last day, and we're about to find out if I did. It's also the first time that I don't have a mic, unfortunately, which is exactly when I need one. So I'm sorry if you can't hear. Let me know. Um, um, actually, is there a mic attached to the camera there? Yeah. Could we have that? Back? Well, it won't do any good. Okay. Yeah. Actually, it's not a speaker. So, um, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about two famous problems in number three, the Riemann hypothesis and the virgin sonnerton dyer conjecture. Um, number theory kind of divides into an analytical side and an algebraic side. And the Riemann hypothesis seems to kind of fit squarely in the analytical side, and BSD kind of connects the two sides. If you look at the Clay Math Institute prize problems, there's seven. Um, the two in number three are the Riemann hypothesis and the BSD conjecture. And I'll make two uh, mathematically precise statements today, which are exactly the statements in those prize problems. But let's start by just counting or enumerating some prime numbers. We make this a little bigger. So uh, let's see, that's 20. So here are the prime numbers up to 200: 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, 23, 29, 31, 37, 41, 43, 47, etc. There's a lot of them. Um, certain number. Um, so let's go up to a thousand. There's even more. You can count really quickly. There's 168. Um, you can go to 10,000, a little over a thousand prime numbers, etc. So there's quite a few prime numbers. There they are. Uh, one very famous mathematician we've all heard of, Gauss, spent an enormous amount of time counting prime numbers over many years. He counted all the prime numbers up to, um, I think, around 6 million, which took him a long time to do. And he didn't get the answer right. He was off by a little bit, just because of making mistakes. Um, but he's very, very close. Actually, if you look outside right now, like right when you walked into the room, you saw this poster, which um, states a very old theorem that there are infinitely many prime numbers, which um, it's a you know, beautiful fact, and it's uh, fairly easy to prove. You just multiply together the first n prime numbers and add 1. And given that you know that every number can be written as a product of primes, that new number we just wrote down has to be divisible by some prime. But it's not divisible by any of the primes that we had already. Therefore, there must be another prime. So there's infinitely many primes. You can use a similar argument to prove that there are infinitely many composite numbers. You take the first n composite numbers, multiply them together, and then don't add one. Boom. Done. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then there's, there's some natural questions you might ask, though. In the poster right outside, where you, um, you have the primes in red, often you have a prime and then a prime like just uh, as close as possible, so two pr primes next to each other. Those are called twin primes. and the question sitting on the wall out there is, are there infinitely many of them? And we don't know yet. Though um, a mathematician famously has proved some amazing results getting us closer to believing that there are, in fact, um, infinitely many twin primes, Zhang. <clears throat> Sorry. So what we're going to look at, zooming out again, is the function pi of x, which is the number of primes up to x. That's a function where it's a pi of 3 is equal to 2, the 2 primes 2 and 3. Um, pi of pi, it's not equal to 2. It's the number of prime numbers less than or equal to the real number of x. So what I'm going to do is draw a plot of this function. Uh, 
Well, here let me do this prime pi. So this is a plot of the function pi of x as x goes up to 25. There's a slight liberty because really I shouldn't draw anything right here since it's a discontinuous function that jumps. But it looks prettier if you do that. So I'm doing this. Um, but it, it looks like a staircase. Um, and it's a staircase where you want your foot stuck in there when you're walking up. Um, you notice it's kind of it's not the best staircase. If somebody built a staircase like this for you, you'd be pretty annoyed because you'd be happily walking and then suddenly not have to step, and then you have normal steps. So, you know, it's kind of unpredictable and random locally, really close. Um, let's try drawing another version up to, say, 100. So this is the a plot of pi of x up to 100. So it starts out 0, and then it becomes 1, then it becomes 2 for a little while, etc. And at 100, it's the 25, since there are 25 primes up to 100. If we go up to 1,000, it um, goes up to 168 right here. And it's starting to look a little smoother as you kind of zoom out. Still pretty chunky, though. And uh, I don't recommend, you know, like, have you ever run upstairs? It works great if the stairs are all in the right place. But if they're not, you kind of trip. It's really bad because then you fall back down. Um, but if we, if we draw this from more of, more of a distance, it starts to look like a nice, smooth curve. Um, I mean, look at that. If you, you know, if you draw, if you just look at this, it's really there's, there's some nice clean curve there, right? Just some function. Um, it almost looks like a straight line. Maybe a straight line that's kind of dip, dipping down a little bit, kind of maybe logarithmically getting not quite straight. So, uh, that's just what I did above. So, <clears throat> up close. The distribution of primes, that is, where the steps suddenly appear, counting the primes, looks very unpredictable. It's really hard to see what's happening up close. Like, as I mentioned before, sometimes there's twin primes, primes one after another. Um, sometimes there's big gaps. Uh, looking around, you know, looking around our lifetimes, um, these are recent prime years. We're in a prime year right now. There's not going to be another one for a while, 2027. So enjoy it while it lasts. Um, but then 2027, the twin prime, it's 2029, just this. So I'm sure there'll be lots of fun problems for the Putnam in 2027 and 2029. <clears throat> but as I was showing you above, let's go way up to a million now. This looks really smooth from a distance. And it really, I mean, like Gauss, you, so let's actually draw the plot that he computed by hand. If like Gauss were to compute this curve up to 6 million, I mean, you kind of, I mean, the, the, you'd want to see what this plot, this plot is clearly some like nice, clean, you know, analytic function. What is it? <clears throat> so this is what the Riemann hypothesis um, is about. It basically gives an answer to the question, what is that function from a distance? Um, a first guess is uh, inspired by the prime number theorem, which was proved about 120 years ago, which says that pi of x is asymptotic to x divided by log of x. This means that um, if you take, for sufficiently large x, if you evaluate pi of x and x over log x and take the quotient, you'll, you'll get closer and closer to 1. It might take a very long time to get close to 1, but you'll, you'll get closer and closer to 1 um, as x gets larger and larger. And so in some sense, the above plot is basically x over log x. But um, what does basically mean? How good is that? Is it really any good at all? Let's see what happens. But first, here's just a little bit of data. Um, I'd rather put some space in. So, uh, OK, those are three evaluations of pi of x over x over log x for larger and larger values of x. And notice that they are, in fact, they appear to be getting closer and closer to 1. And of course, it's a theorem that as x goes to infinity, this does go to 1. Um, incidentally, if you draw, uh, well, let's just do it. Let's plot 
uh, pi of x from you know, 0 up to 10 to the 6. So I'll draw a plot of that. Um, call it g. And then I'll add to it a plot of x divided by log of x. Um, I don't really want to go from 0 because there's all kinds of problems there. So I'll start at 3, go up to 10 to the 6, and I'll make it red. And then I'll show that. Um, here's what you see. So it's a theorem that the quotient of these two plots goes to 1 as x goes to 3. But it's not like we've identified exactly what this nice, smooth-looking from a distance curve is. It's clearly not x over log x. I'm not going to convince you of that at all. Turns out, though, you can try various values of a here, like maybe 2 minus um, x divided by 2 minus log of x. Maybe you'll get something better. So let's try that. Nope. Um, OK, maybe log x minus 2. I mean, kind of fix that it's just a little bit too low. So now it's a little bit too high. So maybe 1.5. I'm just trying to move the red line so it gets on top of the blue line. In fact, if you do the, the best possible choice to get as close as you can overall is 1. And look, that looks really good. Not perfect, but you can almost not tell the difference between the two plots. So pi of x is approximated pretty nicely at least in the range of this plot, by x divided by log of x minus 1, at least as far as your eyes can tell. But how good of an approximation should we even hope for? Um, so, I mean, it's the sort of question you might ask or if you're counting votes in an election or something. Uh, should you, or is it okay if you're counting 120 million votes and you're off by, you know, a million? Or do you want to try to be off by maybe a few thousand only? So it's a difference between how much we're actually off and how much Somebody says we're off. Hi. Um, so a good measure uh, when you're counting a whole bunch of objects of, of your error is you want to try to be off by at most the square root of the number of objects you're counting. That's what will happen if you make little errors as you go. And they kind of mostly cancel themselves out, kind of like a random walk. But every once in a while, they don't. Um, you kind of expect that after counting you know, a million things, if you're very careful, you're going to mess up, and you'll get off, you'll be off by you know around a thousand, and that's kind of what happened with with Gauss actually. He was off by you know a few hundred, so that's what we want to aim for. We want to find an approximation to the nice smooth looking blue curve that is the function of pi of x, with the property that our approximation. Write this um, something here. What is uh, this difference is. Say less than or equal to the square root of x times log of x. It's great if you can't quite see that um, part right here. Log of x times square root of x. In other words, if you actually write down for particular values of x, uh, the difference of our approximating curve to the actual thing pi of x, the first half of the digits should be about the same. I like just write down the two numbers. The first half, the most significant first half, will be the same. The two and then the last few might be different. Let's see how x over log x minus one actually does in practice. So set b equal to 10 to the 6. <clears throat> Prime pi b and b divided by log of b minus 1. So those are our two numbers. It doesn't look so bad. Um, I'm gonna. I want them to appear more nicely. So, uh, oh man. Guess who made a change to Sage Math Club a few minutes before the lecture, which is eliminating new lines. <laughs> Oops, can't believe that happened. Okay, well. Sorry, there are new new lines um, in the output, but they're pretty close. This seems to be you know, kind of nice. Let's try a bigger value of b and see how it works. So still only two digits match up, even with 10 to the 8. So that's not looking so good. Let's try 10 to the 9th. Um, still only two digits match up. So again, if we drew this plot, it would look really good to our eyes, because 
Um, it's really hard to tell the difference in a plot between these two numbers, but it's really um, it's really not that good. So, so still we're only getting two digits that are the same. So the question is, can we do better? And we don't know. It's an open problem whether or not we can do better. But the Riemann hypothesis gives a different candidate where an approximating function is not x over log x minus 1. It's a little different. And um, the conjecture is that it works better than this. In fact, it works as good as we could hope for. So here's the candidate. Um, it's the logarithmic integral, but um, offset slightly. Instead of starting at 0, you start at 2, because <clears throat> that's the first time that you see a prime. So if you replace x over um, log x minus 1 by y of x, then just look at the corresponding plots. So this is what you see when you go up to 100. It looks pretty bad. It's like you know above what you'd hope for. But this is y of x and pi of x up to 100. Let's try up to 1,000. It's not quite as good as what we had before with log of x over, or with x over. Actually, let me throw in the other one. Um, plus plot of x over log of x minus 1 from 2 to b. What color should I make it? Green. 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 Okay, green. Apologies to anyone who's colorblind. Oops. Oh, what happened? Uh, I better not start at 2. So I'll start at 4. Okay, there we are. So log x over log x minus 1 behaves terribly. You know, it doesn't work. I mean, you don't want to, you don't expect this for, you know, every x greater than or equal to 0. But for x greater than or equal to, you know, about 3, this is what you'd hope for. I mean, the red one's actually pretty good at the beginning, isn't it? So the red one's worse, but now let's go up to, say, 10,000. Yeah, it works better for a while. Let's see what happens at 10,000. Come on. All right, so the green one overall looks better than the red one, just not sure. But they're all pretty, they're pretty close to each other. OK, let's try 100,000, which will take a little while. OK, not so bad. Um, there we are. The green one's actually starting to look kind of bad, and the red and blue ones are almost on top of each other. Let's try a million. Here, I'll zoom in. It's really hard to tell the difference. Okay, 10 million. It's really hard to tell the difference. As I said before, the difference between the first two digits being the same and half of the digits being the same is pretty indistinguishable in this sort of distance from a plot. But of course, we can actually just compute the numbers and look at the digits. So let's see what happens. So we'll compute. Um, remember above, I had two of them. I'll just copy those two. And now I'll throw in y of x. And we'll see how we go, how it goes. So y of b. Oops, float. All right, so how does y of 10 to the 10 do compared to, say, x over log x minus 1? So pi of x is on the left. That's the exact count. And then over here, pretty impressive. Um, the first five digits, more than half of them, are the same. So it's dramatically better than x over log x minus 1, despite that not being at all clear from the picture. But it's dramatically better. The Riemann hypothesis, this is 100% equivalent to the formulation involving zeros of the zeta function, it's exactly the statement that, well, you know, write it over there, but it's also just the next slide. that for x, you know, above about 3, pi of x has y of x as a squared good approximation to it. So the Riemann hypothesis, as usually stated, implies this and is implied by this. Um, in Riemann's paper, he writes 
explicitly pi of x as y of x plus a bunch of other terms, where the other terms depend on the zeros, the non-trivial zeros of the zeta function. And if the theorem hypothesis is true, the other terms are really small. If the hypothesis is false, the other terms are not really small. So that's the connection. Very, very common. So do we know whether this we cannot Well, um, well, if your hypothesis is true, you can, you can literally take the infinite series, where each summand corresponds to one of the zeros of the Riemann zeta function, you know, the zeros lying on the critical um, line, and you get an exact formula for pi x in terms of some analytic construction. It's basically like a Fourier series for pi of x that equals it on the nose where the uh, frequencies are the imaginary parts of the zeros of the Riemann zeta function. So, yes? Yeah, I was just going to say, infinitely often it helps with square root of x. Okay, square root of x. Okay. Right, yeah. I mean, whether you can, whether this bound is, you can delete like the log x or something. Well, I tried deleting the log x in a uh, draft of my book with Barry Mazur, and Andrew Granville pointed out it was false, so <laughs> you cannot delete the log x. Um, you really need that here. <laughs> All right. So uh, I'm going to talk also about elliptic curves in a moment, and to kind of connect what we're talking about with elliptic curves. <clears throat> I'll introduce the Riemann zeta function, which I'll start plotting right here. Actually, this is not the something else, so um, I'll delete that. I'll start plotting the Riemann zeta function here. Zeta function has a um, Euler product, product over all prime numbers, 1 over 1 minus p to the minus s. And um, if you're, a, there's a lot of different ways of seeing this. When I look at this, I, to me, it's the, um, I see the characteristic polynomial of a, of a trivial representation in all the denominators with various primes substituted in. So, as a sort of algebraic number theorist, to me this is the care poly of some sort of trivial representation, um, evaluated at p minus s, p to the power of minus s. Uh, this idea of encoding a whole bunch of information about various prime numbers in a single analytic function, of course, goes back really far to Riemann, and it generalizes an enormous amount. Um, there's lots of different ways to construct these sort of generating functions that encode information. Um, this is kind of the simplest possible example. Uh, you have something for each prime, and that something is the number one. But what if you put some other numbers here? There's a lot of ways to do that. Um, or, well, OK, another example is you can take the product over primes p, 1 over 1 minus and then you take the Legendre symbol for some d, p over p, p to the minus s. Okay? And then you get a similar function. It behaves in a way that's similar to the Riemann zeta function. And there are very similar questions you can ask about it. Um, this plot is taking way too long. No, uh, I'm not patient. Uh, so, okay, there's the plot. It should just be almost instantaneous. This is just a complex plot of the Riemann zeta function. And it's a two-dimensional plot. We've just evaluated the zeta function at a lot of points. And uh, 
the you have to look at the docs for the exact definition, but somehow the color at the point tells you both about the magnitude and the argument of the complex number. And the points that I've colored in black are the zeros of the Riemann theta function in this strip that I've given. Um, so this one's around 14, and this one's around 20, and so on. So I'll tell you about another problem. Uh, it's kind of an old problem. <clears throat> and it is a good motivation for the PSD conjecture. And it also will involve some generalization of state of us. So here's the second problem I'm telling you about. So there's it's called the congruent number problem, and it just asks the following. Is there, give a way, give an algorithm to decide whether or not an integer n is a congruent number, where a congruent number is just any integer, that's the area, of a right triangle with rational sides. So a good example of a right triangle with rational sides is, you know, like the most famous one is 3, 4, 5. You have side lengths of 3, 4, and 5, and everybody knows that 3 squared plus 4 squared is 5 squared. Um, and it's a right triangle, and its area is 6. Because I have a 6 there. Um, and so 6 is a congruent number, because it's the area of a right triangle with rational sides. Um, what about 7? What about 1? What about 5? I mean, it's a question. You, you just write down a number, which is... 2017, and then you go, is there some triangle that's a right triangle, that has rational side lengths A, B, and C, and its area is 2017? But the answer is either yes or no. If it's yes, there is an algorithm to find it. Just run through right triangles until you run into it. If the answer is no and you try that, your, your procedure is just going to run forever. So it seems like it might be a hard problem. Um, one surprising thing, here's a quote of John Coates, the congruent number problem, when I just described to you exactly this problem, the written history of which can be traced back at least a millennium, is the oldest unsolved major problem in number theory, and perhaps in the whole of mathematics. I'm not making that claim, John Coates is. And it seemed to be very small, but um, there it is. So, it might be an interesting problem to learn about, as it may very well be the oldest problem. As we all know, you know, if you solve a problem and somebody says it's from 1917, you know, then you can say you solved a 100-year-old problem, and that sounds very impressive. So if you solve the congruent number problem, which again, you actually understand what the statement is, don't you? Yeah, but can you write a little program on a computer? It takes as input an integer, and it outputs yes or no, and it says yes if there's a right triangle of rational sides in that area, and it says no if there isn't. Um, if you can prove such an algorithm exists, or even, or of course, give such an algorithm, then that would solve the congruent number problem. And it may be the oldest unsolved problem in math. And the, I mean, it, it goes, since it goes back a thousand years, of course, it's from the Arabs. And that's, of course, why they really figure out algorithms. Um, by the way, here's some, some examples. So. The three, four, five triangles in the middle has area six. There's a couple of others that you might not know about, which also have area six. Um, you just have to, you know, oh, actually, sorry, I lied. Which also have integer area, not six. The one on the left has area five, and the one on the right has area seven. So this means that five, six, and seven are all congruent numbers. So is that the simplest one? That I think those are all the simplest ones, yeah. But there are many other more complicated. In fact, um, there are inf if, a congruent, if a number is a congruent number, then there are infinitely many different triangles where the coordinates, of course, get infinitely complicated um, with that area, always. You either have none at all or infinitely many. If, if there yes. Are, can you prove that there are none at all? For any, if given an integer for which there are none at all? Fermat. Fermat, theorem of Fermat. One, like you said. It's a theorem. Um, it was, uh, I think it's the case of n equals 3 in Fermat's theorem. It's equivalent to the statement that 
one is not a congruent number. So it's harder to show that something is not a congruent number, maybe. But uh, obviously, I mean, to show something is, you just exhibit it. Right. To show it isn't, it requires an argument. And for mal, even for n equals 3, is not easy to prove. Not trivial. I mean, it's elementary, but it's, it's not easy. Um, so inter-elliptic curves, <clears throat> and hence the VSD conjecture. So an integer n is a congruent number if and only if the elliptic curve y squared equals x cubed minus n squared x, that's the only elliptic curve I'll consider, um, has infinitely many rational solutions which turns out to be the same thing as having any solutions at all for which y is not equal to 0. So I'll, I'll just write that curve down. y squared equals x cubed minus n squared x. Elliptic curves are plain cubic curves, and they can always be put in the form y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b for integers a and b. Or if you're an algebraic geometer, there are GS1 curves with a distinguished rational point. Or if you're an arithmetic geometer, maybe there are abelian varieties of dimension 1. But for us, let's just say they're cubic plane curves. And this is a specific example of such a thing. Um, so for n equals 6, just put a 6 here, and you get y squared x cubed minus 36x. And here's a, the theorem. It's very explicit and, in fact, fairly easy to prove if you state it correctly. Um, it's, kind of, it's really hard to prove, kind of, or it's, it's ugly and confusing if you don't allow n to be negative. If you just allow triangles with negative or positive side links, everything becomes really clean and simple. Whereas if you obsess over areas and side links being positive, it's kind of ugly. Um, Neil Kolbitz has a book where the first chapter is kind of all about exactly this. And he, of course, assumes n is positive, and it makes it all ugly. Then Keith, I was writing up something about this, and Keith Conrad pointed out it's all much easier if you just let n be negative or positive. So, um, so it's really a very explicit correspondence. Um, the set of triples, I, let me zoom in, because obviously this is small. I can barely see it from here. But it's a pretty elementary statement. The set of triples, a, b, c of integers, that are the defined right triangles, so the condition of area n, are in one to one by ejection with the points on this cubic curve with y not equal to zero. And here's the bijection. I mean, it's just a triple goes to this point and a point goes to this triple. Simple as that. And it's just some algebra to verify that this works. It's a nice, clean, simple bijection. Okay, so um, you can very quickly re encode the concurrent number problem as a problem about these curves. The other uh, statement is that um, the solutions with y equal to 0, they're exactly the torsion points on the elliptic curve. And I don't assume that you know exactly what that means, but um, it's pretty clear you don't want y to be 0 here, otherwise you won't really use this bijection, because it doesn't make any sense. But it turns out if there's any point on this curve with y not equal to 0, then there's a construction that lets you make infinitely many other points in the curve. It's like a, just a geometric construction where you, you take a point and then you draw a tangent line to that point, and it will have to intersect. When you draw a tangent line, you get two points of intersection, but it intersects somewhere else because a line and a cubic intersect in three points. And so you just take that other point, and now you've got another point. And you just keep doing this sort of thing, you'll end up with infinitely many new points. Let's see this happen. So first, Let's construct our congruent number curve for n equals 6. <clears throat> so what have I done? Why isn't it? Oh, it's doing exactly what it says it should do. Um, obviously, I should draw a plot of this, so plot of e. I mean, why talk about a cubic plane curve and not even draw a plot of it? OK, so there it is. See the blue line? That is a cubic plane curve, and indeed, to check its cubic, just take a random line and notice how many times it intersects. Three points. Um, you can do something annoying like this, but it actually intersects most at infinity, or in the complex plane. 
Um, so here we are. Uh, this thing e.rank, uh, it turns out that, and if you take, so one of the cool things that makes elliptic curves so interesting is that if you take such a cubic curve and then consider all the rational solutions, that is, solutions where x and y are rational numbers, and then throw in one extra point that's your zero, then um, you get an abelian group. And it turns out it's actually really hard to prove that. Um, it's easy to prove that the, bi the um, binary operation you get is commutative, but it's really hard to prove it's associative. It's like the one example of, a, of an associative operation that's really hard to show is associative. Unlike, say, matrix multiplication or something, or function composition. Um, and here's a point on our curve, uh, minus 3, 9. And here I've just defined explicitly that bijection from above. So this is a function that you put n, x, and y in, and it can shoot back um, the, um, it gives you back the triple a, b, c that give you the side lengths of a triangle corresponding to that point on the curve. So there's our 3, 4, 5 triangle. The fun thing you can do, though, is um, you can take the point that we just found above and add it to itself using the group law. Again, this really just amounts to taking a tangent to that point and doing some construction with it. Um, if you do that, you get another point, kind of a surprise. And then if we just apply the same function, there we are, we get a new triangle. This is a right triangle with area 6 and rational sides. And let's just verify that it has area 6 and that it's actually a right triangle. See, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And you can do this. Let's do it um, a whole bunch of times. So instead of just twice, tell me when to stop. Stop. Okay. Whoa. So those are the coordinates of the rational points on our elliptic curve. And now I'm going to tediously copy and paste them. Down here. And these should be our side links. And let's check that. Let um, me get that and this. Yep. So those are the side links of some right triangle. And it has area 6. And um, there we are. So there are, in fact, maybe you didn't know that there are infinitely many triangles with rational side links right triangles of rational side links in area 6. But in fact, there are. So going back to the oldest unsolved problem in math, is there at least an approach to this problem? Um, so the question of whether or not n is a congruent number is equivalent to asking, are there infinitely many points on this curve? And here's an idea that goes back to Birch and Swinton Dyer from the 60s. It's the following. Let's say you have an elliptic curve, and you want to know whether or not there are infinitely many points on it. Well, that's kind of hard, because like, um, just to give you a sense, for 157, there, is, there are infinitely many points. The simplest point is really big. And in fact, in general, the way these things operate, it's kind of like um, the fundamental unit in a real quadratic field. Often, maybe that means nothing to some of you. Some, somebody here. Tom, <laughs> you'll acknowledge that the fundamental unit in a real quadratic field is big, often. So enormously big, even like uh, the, real, the field Q adjoint square root of D. It might be a very small D, but the smallest unit can be like you know, absolutely enormous. You can use continued fractions to write it down explicitly. So similarly, um, the smallest point on here with y not equal to 0 can be enormous. So it can be hard to find. But here's something that you, no matter what, um, any idiot could just start computing, no matter what n is, and that's the following. It's accessible. Um, take your curve and reduce it modulo prime p. Just reduce it mod, I don't know, 7. Just take the thing and reduce it mod 7. Then you can find all the solutions to the equation y squared equals x cubed minus n squared x, but modulo 7. Right? How would you do that? Like a stupid way is you might just write a for loop and then a, you know, like a nested for loop, run through all the possibilities mod 7, and just check. 
So by this I mean you count up, um, you just count up the pairs, uh, capital X, capital Y, where these are between 0 and 6. And they satisfy this equation, modulo 7. You have a congruence mod 7. See, it's an easy thing. You can just compute it. In fact, in the 60s, Brian Birch, on one of those horribly hard to program um, supercomputers at Cambridge um, called EDSAC, or, yeah, EDSAC, wrote a program to count the number of points at, um, for specific elliptic curves. And so if you count this, you get a whole bunch of numbers. Given any curve at all, and without having to do some like impossibly hard thing, like look for a point with thousands of digits, you just take a bunch of primes and count the number of points. Right? It's doable. You could do it. it doesn't hardly it doesn't even matter how bad the curve is. It doesn't matter at all. You just choose a bunch of primes, count the points. Now here's the heuristic idea, which we still don't know is right or we don't know that's right or not, but we have a lot of evidence it is, and a lot of partial results towards it. The heuristic idea is that if this has infinitely many rational points. And these, these counts mod p, will tend to be, what do you think, big or small? What would be your guess? The curve has a lot of points. What do you think is going to happen mod p? Yeah, most of the time you'll have, this is a curve, an example of a curve in characteristic, I mean, an example of a curve mod p is a line, and it has p points, because there's p points on the line. So um, that's what happens often, but... Um, if this happens to have lots and lots of points, it would be really nice if, in fact, all these had lots of points too, or a lot of them. If there was some bias, some statistical bias where they tend to have more points than you'd expect, at least for small primes. <coughs> and, you know, if you're an analytic number theorist, you might be like, no way that's going to work. If anything small it ends up being canceled out by something big. And, uh, or if you're a pessimist, you think there's just no way it's going to work. But if you're an optimist, like all number theorists are, um, <laughs> You think, oh, of course it's going to work. So let's just figure out a way to nicely formalize it and, you know, efficiently read off what we want. And so Birch and Zurich and Dyer did exactly that. They wrote down a function very much like zeta of s, which encodes the point counts, and then they um, conjectured that that function analytically continued to a complex function on the whole, um, like on the whole complex plane. There it is on the board. It's just um, if you look at the discrepancy between the number of points on the curve and the number of points in the projective line mod p, take all those numbers and you put them in this infinite product. And a priori, when they did this, they didn't know that this infinite product continued to the whole complex plane. But that's now known for all elliptic curves, thanks to work of Wiles um, and other people. Um, and there you are. So they define the function. It's like the Riemann zeta function. There's a lot of techniques for dealing with functions like this. And the hope is that some behavior of this function, some very nice, clean, well-defined behavior of the function, would reflect whether or not there are infinitely many points here. Because after all, even if it's true that there tend to be more points mod p when this is infinite, that might not be very helpful if you don't know what tend to be more points means. Right? Like, how, you have to formalize that somehow. And that can be really wishy-washy. Um, but it turns out things are, are incredibly nice, at least conjecturally. So here's the, here's the situation. Um, just to give you some concrete data before I tell you how things turn out, let's take our curve that corresponds to um, n equals 6. There it is. And this function AP list, it counts the number of points on this curve modulo 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, etc., and then takes P plus 1 and subtracts that number off. So that's what these numbers are. So they're basically the, they're, they're equivalent to the point counts. And uh, let me just write AP um, is P plus 1 minus the number of points. So if the number of points is big, AP is going to tend to be negative, right? And do those numbers tend to be negative? A lot of them are negative. This is exactly the situation where the thing should be big. Let's try another one. Um, I'll do the same thing, but for one for which Fermat proved it's not a congruent number. 
and we'll see what happens. Actually, I have no idea what's going to happen, but let's do it. These don't tend to be as negative, do they? So there's like a little bit of a difference there. Um, and another one where it's not a congruent number. Three. Ah, yes. So again, it's not so explicit, not so striking. There's not a lot of negatives. Let's try one with a five. <laughs> what? The, um, these numbers are negative. Exactly when the cardinality of a of f p, it tends to be big, where big means a little bigger than p plus one. And this, here, this is a congruent number, and it looks like only two of these are positive. This one's not, and four of them are positive. This this one is, and only one of them is positive. So it's still it's annoying. I hope you're annoyed by me just you know, pointing at this and saying a couple of them are positive, therefore something. It's not rigorous at all, is it? It's like, it, it gives you a little tiny bit of hope that there might be something there, but you know, more work is needed to make it make a precise statement. More, but of course, more work has been done. Um, I think I'll skip this and just state it. So here is the uh, conjecture of Bridge and Sprint and Dyer. And it says the following. The, this, uh, the collection of solutions to this equation is infinite if and only if the function LES, which let me remind you, is very analogous to the Riemann zeta function, it's a product over primes, but instead of putting 1 minus p to the minus s, you put 1 minus some very simple recipe involving the number of points on this modulo p. So 1 minus ap, p to the minus s, plus p to the 1 minus 2s. So that's the L function of the elliptic curve. And again, it's very, very analogous to the zeta function. And if a lot of the ap are negative, that makes this denominator big, heuristically at least. And so you might hope that this is equal to 0 when evaluated at 1. Um, it is, again, not obvious that this makes any sense at s equal to 1. For s um, sufficiently large, like its real part sufficiently large, this it's easy to see based on bounds on the AP that this converges and defines an analytic function. There's standard theory for that. But as s goes to the left, you have to work hard to analytically continue this to the whole complex plane. And when I say work hard, you have to work really hard, like in your attic for seven years just to get started. Because um, that is, the, in fact, the theorem that Wiles mostly proved, <clears throat> is that these things analytically continue and have a functional equation. <clears throat> By the way, in the area where you continue them, they're not equal to just evaluating this infinite product. The product converges very badly, and making various assumptions about it converging, it doesn't even converge to this at, say, 1. So it's pretty annoying. But it really, I mean, you really can't see from this. You have to use other theory. Uh, basically, for every elliptic curve, you find some other um, analytic object that corresponds to it called a modular form, and then you can study its behavior, and that will tell you a lot about what happens to this at one. So it's hard to understand this function at one, but at least there's a conjectural statement that the set of solutions to the cubic equation here is infinite if and only if this function is equal to zero at s equal to one. And more precisely, and this is amazing, it's not just um, vanishing of the function at one, it tells you that the set of solutions is infinite. Remember I said that the set of solutions is a group. And as such, um, it turns out it's isomorphic to some direct sum of copies of z and a finite group. And the number of copies of z that equals the order of vanishing of the analytic function LAS at s equal to 1. So the upshot of all that is 
the congruent number problem, which is very old, um, you could solve it if you could prove this conjecture. But unfortunately, no one's proved this conjecture. However, there are a lot of partial results. For example, it is a theorem that if L of E1 is not equal to zero, then the group is definitely finite. So you can use this to make conclusions like half the time, um, which is really cool. That's a pretty difficult theorem, by the way, due to Victor Kalivagen and uh, Dick Gross and um, Sagi and so on. So, but why is that formula natural? Where does it come from? It comes from um, Galois representations attached to elliptic curves. If you look at how, so for, um, <clears throat> sorry, if you look at the points of order L on this elliptic curve, or I shouldn't say L, the points of order P on the elliptic curve over the complex numbers, there is an action of the Galois group of Q bar over Q on it. And this is the characteristic polynomial of a certain natural operator called Frobenius on that two-dimensional Galois representation. And in general, you can, um, to a very wide range of geometric objects like this, you can attach um, Galois representations and then L functions like this. And there's like a whole um, package of similar conjectures called, in general, the block Cotto conjectures and valence of conjectures. Um, so let's finally figure out what's going on this year. Any bets? Absolutely, yes. Why? Because it turns out there is an algorithmic way to decide whether or not L of E1 equals 0. I haven't told you what that is, but um, especially in the case of the congruent number problem, um, Gerald Tunnell proved that there, using theta series, he was able to um, write down some related objects that allow you to very efficiently and algebraically decide whether or not L of E1 equals 0 for the congruent number curves. So you can look at the exact details of that. Beautifully written up in Neil Kovitz's book. So it's really, really clean. You just count some, um, uh, quad, you count some property involving some quadratic form, basically. Um, count sums of certain types of, of numbers with, that equal to something else. And if they sum up in a certain way, then um, L of U1 equals 0. And if they sum up in the other way, then it's not. So it's a very simple thing to compute. And in general, it's algorithmically determinable. For any elliptic curve at all, due to the work of Wiles and the other people, you can always decide whether or not L of E1 equals 0, or, um, just purely algebraically, which is pretty cool and surprising. So um, yes, if the Birch and Swinton dire conjecture is true, you absolutely have an algorithm to decide whether or not a number is a congruent number. And more generally, you have an algorithm to compute the mortal data, or compute the group of points on any elliptic curve over Q. This is, yes, um, the, specific, uh, um, the specific class of curves before Wiles, we knew that it made sense to consider L of E S at S equal to 1, which is right. In general, this is a very special type of curve because it has lots of extra automorphisms. Namely, you can replace X by minus X and Y by I times Y, and you get a symmetry. So that's really unusual. Um, and because of that, you can skip Wiles. He isn't necessary for this particular result. Although, um, there's another paper by Coates and Wiles, which um, gives you a very important <coughs> partial result towards the Birch's <coughs> entire conjecture in the case of complex multiplication of elliptic curves. I think Coates has been trying to prove the congruent number problem for a long time. Um, so let's see what happens. Any guesses about this year? Do you think it's a congruent number or not? Raise your hand if you think it's a congruent number. Great. Three people? Raise your hand if you think it's not. Okay. Raise your hand if you just don't care. Just don't know is in the same. Yeah, okay. Just don't care. I just computed it a few minutes ago and I can't remember, so. Um, let's see. Rank zero. That means there's only finite many points on this curve. 2017 is definitely not a congruent number. There's no rational right triangle with area 2017. So the zero that goes in there, that's, uh, I forgot what that flip curve calculation is. You've got a number and then zero. 
Oh, sorry. Tell me what right the numbers are again. The yes. One is the negative of the square root of the y squared. Right so um, in Sage, there's a command called elliptic curve, yep. which lets you construct an elliptic curve. And to write down the elliptic curve, y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b, you give it two inputs, a and b. So here, there's the a, and b is 0. So um, to illustrate that, I could do it symbolically, I think. Yeah, see? Sorry about that. Um, does anybody, let's see what's going to happen next year. So I'll change it to 2018. But at least we can, it's hard to predict the future, but at least we can predict this. <laughs> um, e dot rank. Ooh, look at that. Unable to compute the rank with certainty um, because a certain group called the Schaffner State Group is not true. Uh, and it has some suggestions. <laughs> yep. Um, there are some other things we can try, though. So, oops, uh, e, oh, it's capital. Uh, what did I do wrong? L, I think it's, I'm just not capitalizing enough letters. Yeah. Else, geez, come on. Um, Taylor series. Maybe it's series. Uh, Taylor series, Chase, come on. <laughs> it's like. So, this is going to numerically compute the Taylor series expansion about s equal to 1. So, it doesn't prove anything, but it will tell us something. At least it should. Oh, it's taking so long. Come on. Should not take. So oh, it's kind of big, but. Yeah, may, maybe it's just going to take too long. Um, there are a lot of tricks you can use to try to get at the rank when you actually care a lot. Um, oh, there it is. Okay, so this is a numerical approximation to the Taylor series. Notice the first coefficient is really, really far from zero. So if any bits of precision are correct, and they, and they are, um, then that tells us that L of 1 is not equal to zero. So 2018 is not a congruent number. Assuming BSD, and that's the part of BSD that's known. It's a theorem that the L function doesn't vanish at one. Um, then the curve has quite many points. The other direction, we don't know. If the L series vanishes, we don't know what happens. Let me just leave you with one other concrete open problem related to this. What's the proportion? 50 50. 50 50% 50 of curves at rank zero asymptotically and 50% at rank one. Yeah, for curves, but yeah. the congruent one? Uh, probably that, but it's subject to debate. And it's numerically, it doesn't look like that at all. And neither does it for all curves. But in the limit, that's typically what people expect. There's so many questions like that, it's even funny. Um, OK, so just to leave you with one open problem, nobody's ever exhibited an elliptic curve which you could prove that the order of vanishing is 4. And um, Here's an example of, no, exactly four, or more. I mean, nobody's given five or six or anything. There, there are explicit elliptic curves of where the order of vanishing is zero, one, two, or three, and there's this curve right here. Doesn't look very complicated, does it? For which um, we think that the order of vanishing is four, but we can't figure out how to prove that. And you can compute its L series. Put its Taylor series to like however many digits of precision you want. But what's the rank of this curve? Four. It has algebraic rank four. It's the simplest one. These, this means six dot a times ten to the power of minus twenty-four in scientific notation. So it's minus twenty-four. So there's twenty-four zeros, and then you get the coefficient of you know, the beginning and then the next one and the next one. It looks very much like 
the order of Yonashim is four. But nobody knows, nobody has even the slightest idea as to a strategy to try to prove that the order of Yonashim is four for this one curve or for any other curves. But this like modular representation and so on? No strategy, nothing. Completely, utterly stumped on how to do this. For this very specific curve right there, and any others for that matter. So when when John Tate talked about the BSD conjecture in Paris when they were doing the Millennium Prize, you know, discussion, this was one of the um, points he emphasized about how hard of a problem it is. And that even for one very particular example. You have no clue how to show that the order of vanishing is actually four at s equal to one, even though obviously it is, right? And I, I think it can compute the rank, yeah. Like four, those are four independent points on the curve, but we don't know that L function really vanishes to order four. It vanishes to order either two or four. We don't know which. Okay, and that's it. I am done. Thank you. Because if I, because of that, because it's at most five since three two point six. Like the, the digits that are here, sh I mean, I, I don't vouch for the digits as they were computed here, but I've computed. We have rigorous, more rigorous methods. The digits are actually right. Uh, but it's just that we don't know. You don't know that zero point zero 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 is actually zero. So with Burton and Dyer, with Burton and Dyer, this is definitely four. Yeah. I see. So it, so you can frequently compute that something. You can compute non-vanishing. Yes, you can always compute non-vanishing. Yeah. But that doesn't do you, um, unless you assume both of them. That's what I'm saying. Yes. Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, for, no, no, I know, so it, um, it does, because I mean, no, we know it's, it's not. It's just computing analytically. It's not using the return to dire at all. Yeah. No, like, that doesn't. Use that, um, we use that. We guess the pair. Right, right. We, we don't know. We know it's not five. We don't know that the, we don't. This tells us absolutely nothing about the algebraic well, rank. Yeah, this tells us nothing about the, the um, group of points at all. It tells us literally nothing. However, something else tells you something about the group of points, namely you directly compute the group of points independent of PSD, and you find that it's a group of rank four with these generators. That's it a actually happened when I typed that connect. So in other words, you know that your computation of the coefficient is good enough that if it's Yes, exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah. But how can you tell the rank exactly for in the target? Um, you mean down here algebraically? Yeah. Um, because you, I mean, because in order to compute this, you compute the two Selmer group. And the Mordell Vey group modulo two times the Mordell Vey group is embedded in the two Selmer group. And the Selmer groups of elliptic curves are, there's an algorithm to compute the Selmer group of the elliptic curve, as it turns out. So, in other words, you chase some diagrams and compute some stuff, and you, in fact, can tell uh, what's going on. However, there's no, you don't, um, there's no algorithm to compute the rank of a curve either. It's completely independent of there not being a way to compute the order of vanishing. There's a procedure that probably works, but we can't prove it works, that takes the curve as input and then hopefully terminates and tells you exactly what the generators are in the mortal loop. Unfortunately, remember that little group that popped up, Shaw, that was in that error message a while back? Mm -hmm. Well, if that group is, it's an abelian group, it's a naturally defined group, it's very analogous to the class group of a number field, or the group of um, equivalence classes of binary quadratic forms of given discriminant. If it's finite, then we can compute more del groups. We can compute the group of points in the curve. If it's infinite, then we can't. We, and we, it's conjecture that it's finite, but nobody knows how to prove that either, unfortunately, in general. And it causes a lot of trouble in practice. So let's thank the okay. speaker again. I think we have more questions.
questions, they can come up and talk to William, and he can whisper the replies. <laughs> Thanks very much. Yep. Incidentally, um, these slides, um, the pre 